Thank you, and it's great to be here at Autodesk University. When we hear about some of the world's most challenging issues, we're often given a stupid multiple choice that goes like this. Would you rather die of climate change or oil wars or perhaps nuclear holocaust? The right answer, which is often left out, is none of the above. Climate change, oil dependence, nuclear proliferation, and a lot of other big problems go away, not at a cost, but at a profit, if we just use energy in a way that saves money. Climate protection, for example, is politically hard only because we got the sign wrong, confusing a plus with a minus sign. In fact, efficiency is cheaper than fuel. Saving fuel is cheaper than buying fuel. So we can talk not about cost and burden and sacrifice, but about profits, jobs, and competitive advantage. That makes the politics a lot easier. That shift could melt any remaining resistance faster than the glaciers. And our strongest tool to make this happen quickly is to improve how we design everything that uses energy. Take my house, for example. Judy and I live at 7,100 feet in the Colorado Rockies. We've seen temperatures there down to minus 47 Fahrenheit and it goes over 80 in the, in the summer. We've had up to 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. It can freeze any day of the year. And this house is 99% passive with no conventional heating or cooling equipment. And yet when you come inside, you find yourself in this delightful tropical environment where the latest three of our 32 banana crops are ripening right now. The house saves 99% of its space in water heating energy, half its water, 90% of its electricity, all with a 10-month payback in 1983. Today's technologies, which we've just retrofitted, are even better, and soon we'll have measured how much better. Now, the key is integrative design that gives multiple benefits from single expenditures. For example, this arch has 12 functions, but only one cost. And hardly any element of the building has fewer than three functions. Now, my house needn't look like this to work like this, and its design approach works in any climate. Similar integrative design applied to an ordinary looking U.S. tract house saved about 90% of its design energy at reduced construction cost, delivering comfort with no air conditioner at up to 115 Fahrenheit, 46 Celsius. And in a Bangkok house, this approach saved 90% of the air conditioning energy to deliver superior comfort at normal construction cost. So why isn't this approach more widespread? Well, because in conventional practice, the more you save, the more it costs, diminishing returns. And in conventional thinking, you invest in efficiency, like adding more insulation, until its marginal cost equals its cumulative savings from using less energy. And that's the cost effectiveness limit where most people stop. But if you keep investing beyond that limit, you reach a point where suddenly your marginal cost goes down. For example, because you no longer need a furnace, ducts, fans, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, fuel supply arrangements. That's what I call tunneling through the cost barrier to achieve expanding returns to investments in efficiency. <clears throat> now this requires removing our metal silos so we optimize a whole system for multiple benefits, not isolated components for single benefits. In our house, for example, I didn't start off by asking, as most engineers would, how much insulation I could add and still save enough money to pay for it. <clears throat> because that's methodologically wrong, even though it's in all the textbooks. It leaves out the avoidable capital cost of the heating equipment. So <clears throat> instead, I asked what integrated combination of insulation and many other technologies would save occupants the most energy and capital cost and discomfort and illness and dismay. So we ended up with a house that creates delight when entered, pleasure and health when occupied, regret when departed. A house that takes nothing, wastes nothing, does no harm, and that saves enough energy to pay for the whole house over a few decades. So this is exactly the approach we took when working recently on the retrofit of the Empire State Building with owner Tony Malkin, Johnson Controls, Jones Lang LaSalle, the Clinton Climate Initiative. And the resulting retrofit now underway is expected to save about 38% of the energy with a three-year payback. That's several times more than they thought would pencil out, uh, thanks to integrative design. 
We start with remanufacturing the six and a half thousand windows on site in an improvised temporary window factory set up on a vacant floor and making them into super windows that are almost perfect in letting in light without heat. And that cuts their uh, winter heat loss by at least two thirds and their summer heat gain by half. So that plus better lights and office equipment cuts the peak cooling load by a third and that lets us tunnel through the cost barrier because now the old chillers no longer need to be replaced and expanded. Instead, they can be renovated and reduced, saving $17.3 million capex and that helps pay for all the other improvements and cuts the payback to three years. Similarly, retrofitting a 20-year-old curtain wall office tower near Chicago could save three quarters of its energy with a payback of minus five months. Slightly cheaper than the routine 20-year renovation you have to do anyway that saves nothing. Of course, the least risky business investment you can make is the capex you didn't spend. Because not only do you get ROI from the energy savings, but your capex is lower too. The same approach works in transportation. Did you know that every day your typical car uses about 100 times its own weight in ancient plants, primeval swamp goo? Well, where does that fuel energy go? 87% of the fuel you put into the tank never gets to the wheels. It's lost in the engine and idling and driveline and accessories. How about the other 13%? Well, 7% is lost heating the air the car pushes aside and heating the tires and road. So only the last 6% ends up accelerating the car and then heating the brakes when you stop. But since only 1 20th of the mass you're accelerating is you, 1920th is a heavy steel car, only 1 20th of that 6% or 0.3% of the fuel actually moves the driver. The good news though is that Two thirds of the energy needed to move the car is caused by its weight and every unit of energy you save at the wheels saves another seven units. You don't need to waste getting it to the wheels. So there's huge leverage in making the car radically lighter weight. Every unit of energy you save at the wheels ends up saving a total of eight units at the tank. Now in the conventional approach, you might think first about making your engine turbocharged or flex fuel or digital or using an electric motor, but you're always better off if you reduce the mass of the car first because that will make whatever powertrain you choose smaller, lighter, cheaper, and then you can sell more of it sooner. Back in year 2000, my team designed that way, this uncompromised, safe, high performance, halved weight midsize SUV. With a Prius-like gasoline hybrid engine, it would get 67 miles per U.S. gallon. That's 3.6 times more efficient than the comparable steel SUV. Or with a hydrogen fuel cell, it would get 114 miles a gallon, a factor 6.3 more efficient. Most surprisingly, the gasoline hybrid version would sell for only $2,500 more. That's a one-year payback because of its two-thirds smaller powertrain, like downsizing mechanicals in a building, and because of its radically simplified manufacturing. Its carbon fiber body, you see, has only 14 parts, each made with one low pressure die set. That saves about 99% of the normal nearly billion dollar tooling cost. Each part can be lifted with one hand and no hoist. The parts then snap precisely together, self-fixturing for bonding without needing the robotic body shop. And if you lay color in the mold, you can also get rid of the paint shop. So there go the two hardest and costliest parts of making the car. And capital intensity would end up at least two-fifths lower than in the uh, leanest plant in the country. Now, new technology can make carbon fiber parts like my little carbon cap here. It's a test piece for a helmet. Uh, in less than a minute, scaling to automotive cost and speed with aerospace performance. Rings like a bell. It's also tougher than titanium. This one's been whacked with a sledgehammer with no damage. Now, think of this really light, strong thing as like finding a Saudi Arabia under Detroit, because that's how much oil the United States would save if we made all our cars and light trucks this way, because we'd save half the weight and half the fuel. The car would get safer because this stuff can absorb 12 times as much crash energy per pound as steel uh, and the car would cost the same to make. Well, the auto industry is getting interested. Uh, <clears throat> two years ago, Toyota showed this concept car called the 1X, 
1 over X because it has the interior volume of a Prius, half the fuel use, and a third the weight. It's a plug-in hybrid, but it's so light and slippery that it needs only a teensy little half-liter engine tucked under the rear seat. Now, showing this turns out to have been a statement of strategic intent, not just a brag. A Torre, the world's leading maker of carbon fiber, announced the previous day a $3 billion factory to mass produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, <laughs> not a phrase previously much heard in the industry. And then Torre then made similar deals with Honda and Nissan, so the next automotive leapfrog is off and running. And now Ford and Audi and Nissan and the Chinese automakers are leading their own lightweighting revolution using metals. The same approach of integrative design works right in industry too. For example, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs motors. Half of that runs pumps and fans. Well, we can save about half of all the motor energy with a one-year payback by integrating 35 retrofits to the motor system, and 28 of those retrofits are free byproducts of the first seven. So it pays back in about a year or less. But first, we should stop wasting most of the energy used by the pumps, fans, and other motor-driven devices. For example, pumps, the biggest use of motors, move fluid through pipes. Uh, redesigning one typical industrial pumping loop cut its pumping power by about tenfold at lower capex just by using fat, short, straight pipes instead of thin, long, crooked pipes. And the designer who did that probably left another fourfold or so savings on the table. This isn't very complicated, it's just good old Victorian engineering. Uh, for example, normally if we have a critical pump next to an identical in-place spare pump, we'd lay it out like this. So the flow always has to go through two right angle bends, that means friction. Why not lay them out instead with no bends in the, in, for the main flow to go through and probably fewer valves? And the same logic applies also with identical pumps in tandem. Well, here's a lovely example from the master designer Liang Lok in Singapore, uh, who, and he's saving here 75 or 80 percent of the pumping energy, but it costs less to build, partly because it makes the pumps, motors, inverters, and electricals a lot smaller. So what does that mean for the electricity that's 60 percent used in motors? Well. Let's start with the coal burned in the power plant. From there to the end use, there are so many compounding losses along the way that only a tenth of the energy in the coal comes out the pipe as flow. But now let's turn that around backwards. So those compounding losses turn into compounding savings going from right to left, and every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe will save 10 units of coal and cost and pollution and global weirding at the power plant. And also, as you go back upstream, each component gets smaller, simpler, and cheaper progressively. So you save the most capital cost as well. So for pumps and fans, just as for cars and buildings, the savings compound as you go back upstream. So you should always start your savings downstream, whether you're designing an oil refinery or a data center or anything else that uses energy. Well, as we saw throughout this talk, Integrative design for radical efficiency makes sense and makes money. But several barriers, often non-technical, get in the way, preventing widespread adoption. You can all help get over those barriers. First, by making sure when you go back to your design screens that you optimize the whole system that you're working on and seek multiple benefits from single expenditures. Second, Rocky Mountain Institute, with help from Autodesk, is launching the Factor 10 Engineering Initiative. 10XE aims at spreading integrative design throughout academia and industry. And to do so, we're writing case studies of great projects that vividly illustrate the techniques and the benefits of integrative design across every design discipline. These examples will make up a case book and can help create other great tools. So please join us by helping to provide cases, write them, spread them, fund the project. For more on 10XE, you can attend a class that I filmed yesterday and that will be videoed tomorrow at 1 p.m. If all of this seems too good to be true, like this uh, 29th crop of, of our passive solar bananas, uh, <coughs> just remember the little quote from Marshall McLuhan, he said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries 
are protected by public incredulity. And I brought along a couple of those bananas for Carl and Jeff to try out. Passive Solar Rocky Mountain Bananas. Thank you very much for your kind attention.